Okay, so I think we can start with announcements now. So for Flash Talks, so we apologize, there was some confusion about whether the Flash Talks were about missions or not. So the idea is that they are about you, your life, and what you do and your interests outside of this program. Uh, so we will have these Flash Talks today. Thank you for your submissions. And then these will be going tomorrow. Uh, and then going forward, whenever we ask for something, we will always submit a sample so that there won't be any confusion like this anymore. So tomorrow we will have a, a quiz. It'll be open for at least a few days after the lecture. That'll be on the Mars lecture, which is tomorrow. Dr. Amy will be coming. Uh, and then team selection is now closed. So thank you everyone for your Canvas submissions. And I just wanted to remind everyone, we need at least one astrobiology focused question in your mission. And these are key themes in astrobiology. So there's a couple that are more on like terraforming Mars or like building Mars habitat. So just be sure that if you wanna go that route that you have at least one astrobiology question. So I'm really excited to introduce uh, our speaker for today, Joseph Marlin, who is the Deputy Chief Engineer of the Blue Ghost Lunar Program at Firefly Aerospace. So Joseph was excited about space from a pretty young age. So we grew up in rural Pennsylvania and there was a huge cornfield behind our house. And whenever there wasn't corn growing there, Joseph would go out there and, and launch small rockets. And me and my other three sisters would rush out and watch from a safe distance. It was always really exciting. And we all knew that like he was gonna do amazing things one day. So he studied math and computer science in university and spent some seven years actually working with uh, electrical grid uh, substations before realizing in the middle of the pandemic that he wanted to pursue a career in space. So he packed up and he moved out to California where he was helping to build the first launch pad for Firefly Aerospace, which was sending rockets into uh, space. So here is uh, him with his launch pad and the rocket. Um, and after the launch pad was completed, he moved to start working on the avionics subsystem for the first Blue Ghost lander. Um, and he was recently promoted to deputy chief engineer of the entire Blue Ghost lunar program, where he's able to work with uh, interfacing different teams and kind of helping all the different components come together for this lunar program. So I'm really excited to have him here because it's really important as scientists that we realize how important the engineers are and that we understand that space is so closely a linkage of science and engineering. So I'm really excited to hear from Joseph and hear about how missions use uh, engineering to work and make the science become a reality. So thank you, Joseph, for giving us your time. We're all really excited to have you here. Thanks, Tess. Yes, uh, many fond memories, uh, blasting rockets off from the cornfield growing up. Um, let's see. Share come up okay? Looks good. Okay. All right. Uh, as Tess said, I'm the Deputy Chief Engineer over at Firefly Aerospace. I'm going to talk a little bit about the company before I get into a little more of the science focus. And we'll talk a little bit about what you as a biology payload might expect if you were tagging along for a mission. As Tess said, space is really this confluence of science and engineering, and both sides often uh, need to work together and uh, in an environment that's extremely demanding and with a, a great number of constraints. And that means that oftentimes, in order to meet one side's goals or objectives, you need to fully understand what the process looks like. So that's what I hope to give you guys a little bit today. Firefly is a, a rocket company at its core, but we have since expanded to being more of a end-to-end -end space transportation company. So. Firefly expects to, or, or Firefly aims to make sure that we can carry a payload from the earth to its final destination, wherever that destination may be. So if that requires going to Mars to do science on Mars, then we can do that all the way from earth to Mars. If that requires going to uh, one of the moons of Jupiter, we can do that too. So. Founded in 2017, Firefly aims to make space for everyone, and that's just a, a phrase that implies that we're trying to bring down the cost to entry by making smaller rockets and more flexible trajectories. We have employees across several states, but our headquarters is in Texas in the United States of America, 
at what we fondly call our rocket ranch. And we have uh, several um, vehicle platforms. We have the launch platform, which you saw in the beginning, that's our rocket. We also have a lander and that's what I work on, our lunar lander program. And then we have the Elytra. The Elytra is an in-space mobility platform, which basically means if we, if with a rocket, take you to low earth orbit, but you need to go somewhere else in our solar system and beyond, that little uh, Elytra will take you where you need to go. And so in that sense, it's sort of a, a, a third stage to the rocket. Well, let's talk a little bit more about what we have where. Uh, as I said, we're based in Texas at the rocket branch. There's a picture of the rocket on one of our test stands. We also have our uh, control center in our uh, Texas-based headquarters building. Tess mentioned that I drove out in the middle of the pandemic to work on a uh, launch site in California. That's at Vandenberg Space Force Base. That's the United States West Coast Launch Complex. And then we're also building a launch pad in uh, Florida at Cape Canaveral. That's one of the most famous launch sites. That is where the Apollo missions launched from. And so uh, we have one of their launch pads there and we'll be launching from there in the next few years. A little bit of a, a look forward in what the company is planning on doing. We're currently flying the Alpha Launch vehicle. That's the smallest vehicle here on the slide. But we're getting bigger and bigger until eventually in 2026, we aim to be launching the MLV. That stands for Medium Launch Vehicle. And that's in partnership with Northrop Grumman. As far as those Elytra product line uh, in-space mobility vehicles, you can see they get larger as we add more capabilities to take you as a payload farther and farther. And then we have two missions uh, already lined up for Blue Ghost and we're uh, bidding on, on more. And so we'll talk a little bit more about those uh, lunar landers in just a minute. Where are we looking to go in the future? Well, we have a whole bunch of big plans and a lot of it relates to expanding our in-space capabilities. So you can see each of the various vehicles fills its own role in getting us to where we wanna go. So the rockets get us off the earth into low earth orbit. And then Elytra kind of takes over and Elytra takes those payloads to the moon or to Mars or other interplanetary transports. After uh, we get to those destinations. We have our landers, which get things down to the surface. So I said we'd talk a little bit more about the lunar program, because that's what I do here at Firefly. And so let's talk about that. Uh, we work with NASA very closely as part of their commercial lunar payload services. That's CLIPS uh, program. In this program, NASA buys lunar lander services from commercial companies. It's a little different than the normal way that NASA works where they buy an entire mission. In this case, they are merely buying a ride and uh, we are encouraged to have other payloads on board while we go down. So CLIPS so far to date has launched nine, uh, has awarded nine missions to various US companies. None of them have launched yet, but the first one is likely to launch this year. And Firefly has received awards number six and number nine. So the most recent one is, uh, is our newest mission. Right now, CLIPS is solely focused on Earth's moon. And here's a little map of where the various CLIPS awards are going. Since this mission, uh, since this graphic was made by NASA, there has been a few updates. First of all, CP21 was awarded and also CS3 was awarded. The CS3 mission is our second mission and that's going to the far side of the moon. As you may know, the moon is tidally locked with Earth. So we only ever see one side of it. And as a result, landing on the far side is a little more challenging. We'll talk about that in a little bit. The other Firefly mission is Blue Ghost uh, mission one here, which is landing in Mare Crisium. That's the Sea of Crises a somewhat foreboding name for a mission, but it's an exciting geological area. 
And you can actually see it with the naked eye. If you look up at the moon, you look at the top right section, you can see a small dark circle. That's a, a mare or a, or a sea. And that's where our first lunar mission will be going next year. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about that mission one. There's a nice rendering of it landing and a little illustration of where it will be going. This was the 19D task order from CLIPS from NASA. And we're expecting it to last about uh, one lunar day. That's about 14 Earth days. And then a few hours actually into lunar night. Lunar night is a very challenging environment to survive in because first of all, there's no sunlight. So we can't generate power. We have to run off only our batteries. And more importantly, it gets extremely cold in lunar night. And so that means we have to power on all our heaters in order to protect ourselves from the extreme cold. On board the Blue Ghost Mission 1 Lunar Lander has 10 NASA sponsored payloads. And uh, the bulk of those payloads actually investigate the various uh, qual quantity, uh, qu qualities of uh, the moon dust. Moon dust is called the regolith. And it has a number of very problematic properties. Specifically, it's extremely sharp, but there's no wind on the moon. That means there's no erosion. And so these pieces of uh, lunar dust get extremely sharp after being pounded by asteroids over the millennia. And it's also electrically charged, which means when astronauts walk in it, it sticks to their suits. These extremely sharp, fine particles get inside the suits and destroy bearings and mechanical interfaces. It's extremely bad to breathe. So overall, very problematic. And so a lot of this mission is going to be studying this regolith in ways to uh, mitigate those problems for the astronauts that will be walking on the moon as part of the Artemis, Artemis program. If you're not familiar with the Artemis program, I should add it is the NASA mission to land the first woman and the first person of color on the moon. And the first Artemis mission was an uncrewed mission that has already launched. The next one should be coming up in the next year or two. I want to talk a little bit about the science that's being done on board Blue Ghost Mission 1, because that's why we're here to do science. There's 10 NASA payloads, like I mentioned. The first is the regolith adherence characterization. This payload has a series of various coatings on that disk you see on the left. And those coatings are different uh, materials that are aiming to prevent dust from sticking to it. So basically, it tests all these different coatings and sees which one has the least dust sticking to it. Over to the right on the top row is scalps. This is the uh, series of cameras that are mounted all over the lander. And they are going to study the way that the moon dust uh, shoots up into the air while we're landing. Moon dust shooting up in, uh, sorry, I said into the air, I should say into space around the lunar lander. Uh, lunar dust is very problematic for landers because it can block visibility and block instruments being able to see where the surface is. By better understanding the moon dust as we land, we'll be better able to ensure that we have safe landings for, for astronauts. Lunar Planet Vac is a a tool that uses compressed air to shoot up regolith into a sampling chamber so they can do experiments on it. Electrostatic dust shield is, a, even if you recall, I mentioned that that regolith is electrically charged. This is an experiment to see if we can use high voltage to repel that uh, lunar dust. The Lister drill is a pneumatic drill. That means it uses compressed air instead of mechanical drilling. It's going to plan on going down about two or three meters into the lunar surface and measure the various temperature gradients as it goes. Next gen, retro, uh, next gen lunar retro reflector and GLR is one of my favorites just from a, uh, uh, I can't believe they can do that perspective. This uh, retro reflector measures pulses, laser pulses from Earth and they time how long those laser pulses take to get back to Earth, and they can figure out how far away the Earth is from the moon down to sub-millimeter range. Uh, retro reflectors have been used on the moon since the days of Apollo, but this is a new one that will be used in conjunction with those Apollo-based 
or Apollo era retro reflectors. All right, moving on, Rad PC is a radiation tolerant computer. The space environment has a lot of radiation and this can cause various electronics to have uh, problems. They can stop working, they can reset, they can uh, be permanently damaged. And so this is an experiment to see if we can make a computer that will be uh, tolerant to those effects, not necessarily immune, just it will be able to keep going despite them. Next, Lunar, I'm just gonna call it LMS. This is a really interesting payload that shoots these four electrodes out in all four directions. And it does that to map the and characterize the moon's mantle by looking at those magnetic fields in all four of the cardinal directions. These uh, spheres you see here are actually the spheres that shoot out. Okay, uh, lastly, we have uh, El uh, Lugre. This is a GPS receiver. It'll be the first time that we attempt to use uh, GPS from outside of the Earth, a very exciting experiment. That's actual cooperation with the uh, with an Italian company in ESA. And then lastly, Lexi. Lexi. Lexi is a telescope, and it will be primarily used actually during the transit to uh, to to the Moon instead of while we're on the surface. So the, we do expect some some operations while we're on the surface. All right, that wraps up the science for Blue Ghost Mission 1. For Blue Ghost Mission 2, as I mentioned, we're going to the far side. And that requires a little bit of extra logistics because the far side is tidally locked away from Earth. It means we can't talk to it with our radio receiving stations on Earth. That means that we have to send two spacecraft, one of which lands and the second of which orbits the Earth and talks to the lander on the far side. Basically what happens is you have the lander landed on the far side and the relay, it's called a relay, a data relay, orbits around the moon. And when it's on the side with the lander, it talks to the lander, saves all that information, goes around to the earth side and relays all that to the earth. Then it gets any updates from earth and goes around again and passes those messages on to the lander. This mission is expected to go in two or three years and it will be carrying unlike the first mission really only one major payload and that is lucy knight lucy knight stands for lunar surface electromagnetics experiment in night and this is a payload that's really looking to explore the very beginnings of the universe this studies the cosmic dark ages about 30,000 years after the Big Bang. And it's a partnership between a bunch of various uh, agencies, including the United States Department of Energy, uh, UC Berkeley, and also NASA's Science Mission Directorate. This is a radio telescope, and that's what those four long antenna are. And it uses the Earth, uh, sorry, excuse me, it uses the moon as a uh, basically a shield. Because it's listening to radio waves from the very beginning of time, it needs an extremely quiet radio environment. And so by being on the far side of the moon, we can use the mass of the moon to block all of the noisy radio waves from Earth. And uh, we, we can take advantage of that very quiet radio, radio silence on the far side of the moon. If you notice night at the end of the uh, payload's name, that's because it does plan to mostly operate during night. And that's to, in order to keep the radio noise from the sun out of the uh, measurements as well. All right, let's talk a little bit now about how if you were a payload, you would get to your destination. There's a few different places you can put payloads on uh, our landers, basically, uh, you could go on the lander itself, or you could go on the, the relay, the transfer vehicle. One of the most important things when you're working on landers or even anything in space is mass. Mass is extremely expensive to get into space because you have to fight gravity the entire way while you're on the rocket. As a result, most of the time you'll see payloads specified in terms of mass. So we can get 150 kilograms to the surface 
or much more into orbit around the moon. If you're wondering why it's so much more around the moon than it is to the surface of the moon, again, it comes down to those gravity losses. As you're landing on the moon, you have to slow your, your vehicle down quite a bit. You're moving very fast while you're in orbit. And so you have to slow your vehicle down all the way to barely moving. And the entire time you're doing that, you're fighting gravity. Planetary protection is a very important thing if you are sending science to a, another, or, uh, another planetary body. NASA has planetary protection provisions for various uh, destinations, and they categorize them differently depending on what the destination is. For example, the moon is in general not a great place to look for uh, signs of life. This is because the moon has no atmosphere and most of the requirements for what life needs as we understand life do not exist on Earth's moon. And so they're not particularly worried about us contaminating the moon. However, they do have a baseline number of requirements and to that end, Firefly does operate a clean room where we try to keep all of our spacecraft electronics and structures as clean as possible. The goal here is to make sure that we as uh, humanity does not accidentally contaminate uh, any of the other bodies in our solar system with life and then find that life and say, hey, look at that, there's life on Jupiter. Uh, so basically we need to keep our uh, spacecraft as clean as possible. There are a few areas on the moon where we are actually concerned with planetary protection. These include permanently shadowed regions, which are areas that have not seen sunlight for millions of years. And as a result, they have a lot of uh, volatiles in the compounds in the, in the lunar surface. This means that they have a lot of value to understand the history of the moon and the history of the solar system. And they also often contain large amounts of liquid water ice. As a result, it's important to keep those areas clean so we can do good science there. And then they also, NASA also mentions that they wanna keep the Apollo landing sites clean, both because of the interesting heritage of those sites and because of the scientific value of those sites. So to that end, uh, Firefly does, like I mentioned, operate a clean room, but it's important to note that if you are doing a uh, mission to anywhere else besides Earth Moon, you're likely gonna have uh, you're going to work with a space company that's going to do a lot more effort into keeping everything clean and pristine in order to make sure that the science results you get back from your astrobiology experiment are relevant and reliable. All right, next I want to talk about what it looks like to send a payload to a, uh, to a destination. Let's say you have an astrobiology experiment that you want to send to Mars and you want to do some checks for life to see if you can find certain compounds that might have uh, you know, in the past been associated with uh, organic life forms. And so the first thing you would do is design, a, a design your, your payload and come up with ICDs. Now in this sense, a payload is simply a device that you want to send to the surface. It can be uh, a, a maybe a, a sampling drill and then some maybe a mass spectrometer if you want to look at the, the results of your sample or it can be something as uh, as simple as maybe a mirror like the retroreflector regardless of what it is it needs to have a design and then it needs to have an icd the icd stands for interconnect diagram or definition and it is basically uh, i have an example of the apollo icd it kind of explains to the user what the expected uh, interface between the payload, that's you, and the spacecraft, that's us. After you go back and forth and you design this payload in cooperation with the, uh, the spacecraft manufacturer and you, you make sure that all of your needs are, are being met from the science perspective and that uh, you aren't asking for more power than they can give you and you're not taking more mass than they can take you go ahead and you do fit checks and mass models. Fit checks and mass models are important because they are the first time that you actually make sure that
that your payload will fit on top of the spacecraft. So here you can see a picture of the Blue Ghost Lunar Lander mass model. This is a representative model of the lander and it's mounted on a vi vibration isolator so that we can transport it safely. We take this mass model to large vibration tables and we shake it to uh, emulate what will happen during a uh, launch vehicle ascent. And we make sure that all the payloads are gonna be safe for that very rough ride to space. Also around the time that you'll be doing fit checks and mass models, you'll also probably get something like a payload integration test kit. This is the ability for you to test your data interfaces. Most payloads have an onboard computer that controls the payload and maybe does a little bit of preliminary science before you even get those results to Earth. In this sense, it's important to make sure that your payload computer can talk well to the spacecraft computer and the spacecraft radios. And so what you see on the right is a picture of a generic flat sat. This is not our flat sat, but it's what flat sats look like. It's called a flat sat because it's basically all the electronics of the satellite laid out on a table on a flat surface. And this allows you to test all of the electrical interfaces before you're even building your lander. The payloads would come here or they would uh, receive a, a, a model of the spacecraft computer and they would go ahead and test and make sure that all of, all of the payloads computers and all the payloads protocols can communicate properly with the onboard computer. When you are sure that your payload is speaking well with the computer and it fits on the spacecraft and you're getting the right amount of power and data and you have the right ma mass, you go ahead and deliver it. And here's a, a picture from one of our payload deliveries. This is Lunar Planet VAC delivering their spacecraft to us here at Firefly. In the middle is our mission manager. And then on the two, uh, on either side of her is two of the lead engineers from the Lunar Planet VAC team. At delivery, we do a number of tests to make sure that everything is working as it should be before they uh, leave. And uh, that way, if there are any problems, the, the experts that build the payload can, can fix it. Also in this image is the PI, that stands for Principal Investigator. And so these, these folks are basically what you would be, the, the, the person in charge of all the science on the, the payload. And so even though they might not be the technical authority on, what, on how the payload actually works, they're there to make sure that the science objectives are gonna be met. After the delivery is complete, we do a safe to mate. This is where we check all the interfaces and make sure that if we power it on, everything is gonna be powered on correctly and we won't accidentally damage the payload. And from that point on, it's time to start actually building it into the spacecraft. Here's one of our lead avionics, uh, excuse me, one of our lead AI and T engineers. That's an uh, assembly integration and test engineers and one of our technicians. And they are both uh, working to integrate various cable harnesses onto the spacecraft in preparation for adding the actual payload to the spacecraft. So that's the actual lunar lander there that they're working on. Okay. After the payload is successfully mated to the spacecraft, we'll do checkouts where we actually run the flight computers talking to the uh, avionics on board the spacecraft, which are then talking to the payload. And we make sure that end-to-end -end, uh, that end-to-end -end communication pathway works. This is obviously not a picture of the payload on the spacecraft yet, because uh, that hasn't happened yet, but it'll be happening in just a few weeks. And uh, we'll be doing that exact training that I'm describing. When the spacecraft is fully built, we take the entire spacecraft to large chambers. This is an example of an anechoic ch test chamber. This is a test to look at the various electromagnetic interferences and make sure that none of the payloads will be hurt by the spacecraft's radios. 
and vice versa. We also take this spacecraft to very large thermal chambers where we can make sure that they will work uh, amongst hot temperatures and cold temperatures. And we take it to very large vibration tables where we shake the entire spacecraft at a uh, same profile as the launch vehicle to make sure it will survive that. The next part is the part that everyone's familiar with. That's when we shoot the payloads and the spacecraft into space. And from there, we move on to launch uh, into LEOP, which stands for basically launch and early operations. This is the commissioning phase of the spacecraft where we power everything on for the very first time while it's in space. And we work to make sure that all the payloads are working correctly. So the various instruments are turned on and they're tested and make sure that they're still working after the long launch to space. And the PIs will check to make sure that all the data they're getting from their instruments looks like it's in expected bounds so that we can make sure that if we need to calibrate anything, we do that and make sure that we're not getting any unexpected impacts from the space environment. I've mentioned now a few times that the space environment is really pretty traumatic from a spacecraft. The uh, has huge ranges of uh, temperature as we go out from behind the Earth's shadow and, and then back into the sun as we orbit the Earth. It has quite a bit of radiation in the Earth's radiation belts, the Van Allen belts. You have very severe vibrations during launch and during landing. You have atomic oxygen, which can erode surfaces. And you have a, a great deal of uh, just, just logistical concerns as you try to, to move between various comm stations on the Earth. We have various radar dishes, uh, excuse me, satellite receivers scattered throughout the Earth's surface. But over the ocean, for example, you're unlikely to get a good link. And so you have to make sure that the satellite can uh, control itself while you're in between ground stations. Lastly, this is now you've completed your long wait to get your actual science results back from the spacecraft. The operations period begins with a LEOP, but it ends whenever you arrive at your destination, you actually turn on your instruments to start performing your science. Most payloads will have worked out beforehand when they want to operate, but some of them will need to make decisions based on the science that they're getting back on what they want to do next. And so the science teams work very closely with the operators to define what decisions you wanna make each day and what operations you wanna perform. For example, on the, on the surface of Mars, the uh, next day's Operations are planned by the ops team the day before when they plan where each rover is going to go and when each of the instruments is going to be active. That's going to work the same way for us on the moon. We'll each day we'll plan on which operations will be uh, performed. And we also want to make sure that none of the other payloads are going to interfere with each other. For example, if you have a payload that wants to see how well dust uh, can be rejected. You don't want to operate that at the same time as the drill because the drill kicks up a lot of dust. This overall is referred to as CONOPS. That's the concept of operations. And it's the plan that you have in order to define what operations you're going to do when. Okay. I now want to do a quick plug for any of you who are interested in sending science into orbit. Firefly is offering free uh, launch for CubeSats. So if you know of a CubeSat team or work on a CubeSat team and you wanna do some science, you can get a free ride to space. And uh, you can find out more there at fireflyspace.com slash dream because this is free and it's aimed at education. Uh, it does need to be an educational institution looking to help train that next generation of rocket scientists and, uh, and, and science. That's all I had for my presentation. Uh, I hope you guys learned a little bit more about the uh, process by which you as a scientist would get your payload to, to space and to orbit or to wherever your final destination may be. I'm glad to answer any questions. Thank you, that was great.
So anyone who has questions, you can now ask in the live questions channel on Discord. Um, I would like to start with my own question. How do you guys select which science payloads get to go on each uh, mission? For CLIPS programs, that's actually selected by the NASA CLIPS office. NASA CLIPS will uh, review hundreds of proposals for various science that they want to send to the moon, and it will select some based on a number of um, criteria, including value to the decadal surveys and to the Artemis program, as well as simply what the mass of the payload is and, and how much it prevents uh, other payloads from coming along. Cool. Um, so let's see, Agatha from the UK is asking if the moon environment sees more radiation than typical space missions, and if the regolith and moon environment cause any interaction with communications and radio waves. Okay, so for the first question, does the moon see more radiation activity than the uh, typical space mission? So I'll define typical space mission as something in Earth orbit. And the answer is that's a little complicated, but basically the, uh, the, a, a large amount of the radiation that you experience in space is the radiation is trapped particles in the Van Allen belts. These are often trapped protons and trapped electrons in the Van Allen belts. And there's also the South Atlantic anomaly. This is the bulk of the total ionizing dose that a spacecraft will experience. And so in that sense, going to the moon is actually less radiation than a payload that stays in Earth orbit for its lifetime. However, because you do have that protective magnetic field that traps those particles there in the first place, the Earth actually suffers less from a phenomenon called GCRs, galactic cosmic rays. And these are uh, either uh, spit out from the sun or they're just coming from other places in the uh, universe. And because of that, uh, the, the moon's exposure to galactic cosmic rays is actually a little more severe than it is on Earth. So uh, it can be a little bit of both. Um, it is worth noting that a lunar lander has a much, much, much shorter period of, of operation than a typical Earth orbiting satellite. And so in general, from a total dose perspective, you have much less uh, concern for a lunar lander than you would for a, an orbit, uh, an orbiter around Earth. And the second question was, uh, do, does the moon's uh, dust have any impact on uh, radio waves? And the answer is not so far as we know. Um, that said, there have been uh, precious few lunar landers. And so uh, that'll probably be something we'll be continuing to watch for. Thank you. Um, so then Muhammad asks, what can we expect to be different on the dark side of the moon and will it have different geology or mineralogy compared to the brighter side? Interesting. Uh, well, definitely the, um, the far side of the moon has many more craters and that's as a result of uh, not having that protective shield from the earth, which can burn up some incoming craters. That's why you see a lot of those maris, the, the big dark areas of, of magma, of cooled magma on the earth's side. And then on, if you look at pictures of the far side, it's, it's very cratered. And so from that perspective, we can expect to see a lot more uh, extra, extra lunar uh, geology on the far side, just by merit of having uh, more craters. And is that the whole question? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, so another question about sustainability. Um, so Agatha was wondering, is there any goals of looking into sustainable rocket fuels and your overall goals of improving space accessibility? Yeah, so that's one of the, the, the most exciting things about permanently shadowed regions is they do have large amounts of liquid, uh, of, of frozen water ice. And so, uh, you know, you can you can turn water into hydrogen and use that as a fuel and from that perspective the moon could be a great way station a refueling station for for future missions cool um and then there's a few questions on the free cubes at launch do you mind going back a slide to just show that url again uh yes 
Okay, so here's the website, and I assume there's more information here that you guys could all get. Um, yes, so, yes, so on the website, there is an RFP which states all the requirements that you need to submit while applying for this. And uh, Firefly will review them and select those that have, uh, you know, the most ability to, to help educational institutions. Would a nonprofit like Womenium also qualify? Yeah, I think on our first stream mission, we flew something from Teachers in Space. Um, so yeah, I think so. All right, guys. Can we do a cube set? <laughs> that's trying to make it happen. <laughs> exactly. Very cool. Okay, another question. Uh, so are there any plans to drill through ice caps and search for liquid water, asks Sudha. Uh, are there any plans to drill through liquid water? Or, or uh, through ice through caps. Ice to look for liquid Ah, uh, I don't think that there's any current evidence that there is uh, large underground reservoirs of liquid water. However, um, the next uh, Eclipse mission that's being bid does include a large drill called Prospect. And that drill is looking to drill into permanently shadowed regions, uh, very small ones called micro PSRs and study the volatiles in those regions. And I think based on the science returned from that mission, that could inform a decision not to eventually send something to drill into it, to an ice cap. What's the scale of a micro PSR? Like how small is it? It could be anywhere from a few meters to a few centimeters. Very cool, thank you. Okay, let's see. So Joshua from the Philippines asks, uh, while Firefly's dedication to reducing the cost and enhancing the efficiency of space travel is exciting, it's integrating technologies to decrease the impact of upcoming missions on the expanding collection of space debris around Earth's orbit, part of this vision. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, a big concern for everyone, obviously. Um, and that's one of the, the reasons that we're building Elytra Elytra is really good at moving things around in space. And what that means is it's also very good at bringing things back down to Earth. And I, th I think one of the biggest challenges facing us as far as orbital debris mitigation is um, sort of how to actually go that last mile. We're, we're, we're plenty good at getting stuff into space and moving around in space, but you got to get a hold of something. Uh, and it could be something that's out of control and tumbling. And there's the number one concern would be that if anything goes wrong with that, you can actually have a collision and make far more orbital debris than you had before. So uh, it's solving that last mile problem that a lot of companies are working on with really exciting ideas, which could have a lot of synergy with the Elytra vehicle to get the, those pieces of debris down, especially out of control, obsolete satellites. And would you work with like also taking debris from like other companies or even other countries or would it mostly be your own debris? No, the, the goal would be that, you know, um, we get contracts from, you know, whichever company put it up there to, to bring it back down. Very cool. Um, so Abbas, oh, Abbas from, the, uh, from Pakistan asks, how will Elytra be fueled and will every mission need one? Elytra is going to be fueled in two different ways. The, the first Elytra we're sending up is fueled with just cold gas thrusters. And so this is basically, you just have pressurized gas and you uh, release it and that pressure decreasing uh, accelerates the, the particles away from the spacecraft and therefore the spacecraft away from the particles. Uh, that said, uh, future versions of Elytra, including the one that gets Blue Ghost Mission 2 to the moon, will have chemical thrusters. That means it, it uses uh, actual propulsion. And we use hypergolic propulsion. Uh, that means it's uh, chemicals that when they touch each other spontaneously ignite. Uh, that's much easier to work with like than something with uh, like kerosene and, and liquid oxygen because that needs to be ignited before it, um, before it can, can, can provide a, an impulse. And so, um, and what was the second half of that question? Um, will every mission need a new one? Ah, uh, not every mission needs an Elytra. Elytras can stay in space and, and serve as multiple satellites. And also some, uh, for example, our first lunar lander is able to get to the moon all, on, all on its own. It doesn't need uh, an Elytra to get it there. 
the second one needs an elotrip because it's much larger, that, that large radio telescope on the surface. Also because it needs a uh, relay. Um, and then the orbiter for your second one, will that be used for future landers as well? Or will it just mostly be for yeah. that mission? Absolutely. That we're expecting to have at least a five-year lifespan on that uh, orbiter. And so that will be able to serve as a relay for future lunar landers, for Artemis missions, or for, uh, for our own uh, projects. It actually has enough uh, uh, propellant to, to travel to Mars if we decide we want to, to go that way. Oh, very cool. Uh, but uh, so Agatha is asking if the orbiter would come back to Earth or if it's just going to stay out there. No, the orbital, that, that orbiter for our second mission will just stay at the moon, orbiting the moon, uh, in order to provide relay services to the various landers that will be following us. Cool. Um, so then there's a question about the name of the company. So how did you guys come up with Firefly Aerospace? A uh, controversial question. The uh, founder insists that it happened because one night on his porch in the, the fields of Texas, he looked up at the sky and marveled at all the fireflies and thought to himself that one day we'll have so many satellites and rockets in space that this, this, the sun, uh, that, that the night sky will look like that with uh, the satellites. Uh, but I think it's because of the TV show. <laughs> Better answer. Um, so Sita is asking if you could elaborate on using hydrogen and oxygen on the moon as fuel and whether that's easy. Well, it's, it's nothing in space is easy. The, uh, and that least of all, there's a lot that needs to be done before, uh, before that would be practical. Not the first of which would be finding a large enough, uh, deposit of it and figuring out how to actually do the electrolysis on it to split it. But after that, uh, you know, you could, you could use that, uh, you could, you could make tanks to store it and, and use it to refill future missions. Very cool. Um, so then there's a question on the cleaning process. Um, so they're, they're clean. Do you, do you have any sense of like when they, when they, uh, is there any way to monitor how clean they are once they get out there? Basically, like uh, like your landers, like to see, they? like yeah, uh, the they're asking about the rockets, but I guess also like in the landers, like can you monitor how much like the buildup is on them? Yes. Uh, well, so for rockets, uh, there's no cleanliness requirement because they don't go anywhere; they just fall back down to earth and are reused or burn up in the atmosphere, and. Uh, or, or rather, or, or fall into the ocean. The uh, spacecraft, the general philosophy is it's easy to keep something clean than to get it clean after it's become dirty. And so we uh, go through a lot of processes to get things clean in the first place. This involves wiping it down with IPA, that's isopropyl alcohol, and uh, putting things through thermal cycles at high temperatures in order to burn off any like oils from fingers, or uh, other other materials. The uh, and then once it's in the clean room, uh, you know nothing is touched without gloves and, and hair nets. There's various cleanliness levels from NASA's concept of visibly clean, which defines a certain number of particles visible from a certain distance without magnification, all the way down to you know you can actually send things away to be tested based on samples. Very cool. Uh, oh, we we so, have a number of like ultrasonic cleaners and, and so forth for that purpose. Oh, that's as really well. cool. Um, so another question. So at the end of the life of the orbiter, it will it crash onto the lunar surface, or what will the, its end life look like? Oh, that's so sad. Um, <laughs> silence. Uh, yes, it will crash onto the lunar surface, and or, or it will be disposed of in what's called a graveyard orbit which is basically uh, an orbit that's far out of the way of anything that could, could be uh, affected by it. If it, uh, if it does crash into the lunar surface, obviously uh, work would have to be performed ahead of time to make sure that it avoids any heritage sites. That's the, what they call the Apollo areas um, in order to make sure that we don't damage any of the, the NASA heritage sites. Are there heritage sites from any of the other companies that people are particularly caring about? Or, sorry, any of the other countries? I suppose 
the uh, let's see. I don't recall if well, definitely uh, the Chinese have a, a, a rover, and I, I believe both Russia and China have also successfully landed, and so each of those would have uh, areas where they also are concerned with, but uh, call it U.S. centric or just realistic. N none of those sites have had uh, human landing, so they're perhaps somewhat less concerning. That said, we certainly don't want to be crashing into someone's operational rover. That's fair. Um, so yeah. then could you give some advice on like getting like into space, like from a different career path? Yeah, good time to do so right now. There's been a lot of, uh, at least in certain areas, it's tough to find people with the, uh, with the, the background needed. Um, there's, uh, so, so is it specifically from uh, other career paths or, or from out of college? Uh, maybe both, like, like coming from a, like not getting a direct degree in aerospace engineering. Sure. I would actually say, uh, you know, many people do not have degrees in, in aerospace engineering. And one of the problems with aerospace engineering is it's a little too uh, generalized. And so often you can have better luck getting a degree in a specific engineering field, whether that be propulsion or uh, a structural engineer or, or uh, electrical engineer, mechanical engineer, than you might uh, as just a generic aerospace engineer. The, uh, as, as from coming from a different perspective, uh, from a different career, the key is just to uh, talk about how your experiences in those other careers can benefit the company that you're applying to. A lot of people will come in with resumes talking about why they want the job, but at the end of the day, what the company wants to know is why you would help them. And so if you can show how your experiences in a different industry will help that space company, you're much more likely to get in. That's very good advice. Uh, so Sarah from Mexico is asking if you can elaborate on how you would study the origin of the universe from the dark side of the moon and what exactly is being looked for? Yeah, it's looking for the cause, it's looking into the cosmic dark ages. And so this is radio signals from the Big Bang at a very, very low wavelength. And that's the reason for those long antennas. Um, so not being uh, on the, the science team for that mission itself, I don't know if I can intelligently speak more to it than that, but I encourage you to look into the Lucy Knight payload and uh, if you're at all interested in that and, and kind of study what, uh, what that science is looking to accomplish. Thank you. Okay, uh, so there's a question about the extraterrestrial end of life. Oh, so I think she's saying like in general, when you are thinking about like crashing things into the surface and stuff, like is there a set of guidelines and rules that you have to follow when you're thinking about end of life for your your uh, missions? Not yet. Um, certainly for you know for Earth orbit, there has been uh, you know new regulations that say all spacecraft must be able to come down within five years, and so that will help that orbital debris problem at, at Earth. But as for uh, you know extraterrestrial, no, there's no uh, there's no sets of guidelines right now. You know, Cassini burned up in Saturn's atmosphere. Um, we will be crashing into the Moon, um, of one of the uh, elements of our mission of our second mission, and maybe even the the, the payload. But um, you know, it, it sounds kind of. Uh, no, harsh is the right word, but it sounds kind of irresponsible to just go like chucking stuff into the moon. But it's important to note that, um, you know, there's, uh, there's there's nothing on the moon right now except for numerous uh, crashed payloads. And so uh, there's uh, the only thing that you really need to watch out for is, is areas that have already been explored. And so the goal is just to avoid all of those. Makes sense. Uh, so there's a question about international authority for space missions. So is there like an international set of regulations or can like anyone do basically anything with space in the moon if they have the money for it? Well, the most exciting update for moon uh, exploration and international cooperation is the Artemis Accords. Quite a few countries have signed on to the Artemis Accords. Uh, I was actually just speaking to someone from the Brazilian Space Agency and they just recently signed the Artemis Accords and are gonna be working in that. And the Artemis Accords are basically a, a, a framework of agreements for 
what to, and how to operate on the moon. It includes details like you can't claim the moon, and it also includes operational details such as, uh, you know, the, the framework provides a, a precedent for agreements such as LunaNet. LunaNet is an agreement of which frequencies can be used where on the moon. And uh, so, I don't know if you can see it, but I have here the LunaNet, uh, the, some of the LunaNet requirements. And so this basically just shows which, um, which uh, 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 frequencies can be used in which direction. And it defines everything from Earth to or lunar orbit, and then from lunar orbit to lunar surface and, and vice versa. And so there's a lot of this growing uh, framework as the lunar surface becomes more populated and lunar orbit becomes more populated. Uh, we're thankfully starting to see a lot of really good cooperation uh, led by, I think, the Artemis Accords and, and all the, the, the countries that have signed on to those. Very cool. All right, we're almost at time, so I think we'll wrap up there. Um, so I really would like to thank you on behalf of the whole team for giving us this amazing presentation and sharing an hour of your morning with us. This is really exciting. I feel like I learned a lot and I hope everyone else did as well. So thank you, Joseph. Absolutely. Um, I guess uh, if, if you'd like, Teresa, you can send out my email and anyone with questions can shoot them over to me if I didn't get to them or if they have any other questions. And uh, yeah, on behalf of everyone here at Firefly, thanks so much for everything that you guys are doing um, to, to promote science and uh, explore the universe around us. Thanks Tess and thanks Prachi and thanks everyone else for, for having me. Thank yeah. you, Joseph. Yeah. We um, love so you. Thank you for inspiring us. Yes. Of course, um, thank you. So everyone, if you want to stay on the line, we'll have a few flash talks after this, but uh, we can say thank you and goodbye to Joseph. All right. Thanks. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. All right. So I hope this uh, gave everyone a really nice overview of how missions are planned today and how you could start planning your mission as well. Um, if you have questions, again, we are always here to help you and help you think through your mission. Uh, but this was a really great example, I think, of how to plan missions. What does the process look like? What do realistic timelines look like as well? And how do real engineers plan, uh, plan their missions and payloads? So very exciting. All right. So I know many of you actually do are really interesting people. You do really interesting work. I'm sure all of you are very interesting, but some of you particularly are working on very interesting projects. So this is where we created a flash talks, which are totally optional. This is a way for us to get to know each other. And uh, we would love to invite you to, we will extend the canvas link. We would love to invite you to keep, keep submitting your presentations. We could do this for longer and longer as well. We have four presentations today. Uh, we'll have a few more tomorrow as well. But really, this is our time to get to know each other and all, all the cool stuff we're all doing amongst each other. Um, so yeah, please submit for the Flash Talk if you are interested, want to share your work as well. Today, we have four amazing speakers who will share more about themselves. So give me a minute and we'll slowly start inviting them here. Um, to the four speakers who are speaking today, please... Uh, you are able to now turn on your microphone. Also, if you turn on your video, we'll, we, will able, we will be able to spotlight you. Each of you have about two minutes to present yourselves. There, I see Barrett. Um, each of you have about, yeah, Gabrielle is here as well. Two minutes to present yourself and then Tess can do uh, the screen share. We have all your slides ready as well. Give me a minute. Uh, Nina, if you wanna come on board. Um, so it'll be Gabrielle, Nina, Gabriela, Nina, uh, Anna, and then uh, both. Perfect. Give me a second. I'm trying to get this screen share working. Hi, Anna. Okay. So Nina as well. Perfect. Can you guys see the full screen? Now we can. Cool. Okay, so Gab, would you like to take it away? I'll take it away. So hi, everybody. I'm Gabby Rizzo. I am a microbiology major at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and I'm just about to graduate. Scary, but exciting. 
Um, but I wanted to share with you guys today some research that I did at the University of Nebraska Lincoln this summer. I was at an RU. Um, so there's a lot on the screen. There's a lot. It was easier to just share the slide. Um, so just to give you context, so we know that methane has been detected in the Martian atmosphere. And we also know that magnesium carbonate and calcium carbonate have been identified on the Martian surface. So those carbonates are extremely important to us and super interesting because they're generally formed by aqueous processes, which means that liquid water was present at the time of their formation. So knowing that and knowing that um, knowing the methane is present in the atmosphere, this all supports the study of methanogens for a possibility of extraterrestrial life. So there was a lot to this project. The first half of this was I characterized a new species of methanobacterium, um, species ACI is what we're proposing. So there was a paper published a few months ago that kind of made this checklist of mandatory things that we need to find in order to publish a new species. That's the easiest way to explain it. So out of that checklist, I chose three things to look at in regards to this um, isolate. So the first thing I looked at was its growth under, st under standard conditions. The second thing I looked at was its um, optimal uh, NaCl concentration. And then the last thing was its susceptibility to lysis. So the first thing was just running a simple growth curve, um, which worked. I mean, it, there was a predictive pattern, so we knew it worked. The second thing, the NaCl concentration, we did an experiment ranging from 0% salinity to 10% salinity and found that methanobacterium ACI could tolerate those conditions, but grew best at 0% salinity. And susceptibility to lysis, we did um, osmotic lysing, which just means we added distilled water. And then the other way we did it was detergent-based cell lysing, which uh, we added 0.2% SDS. And the methanobacterium could lyse using uh, the distilled water, but not with the SDS. We don't care by what method it lyses, as long as it can lyse, that's really good for us because that means we could do more analysis um, on the methanobacterium. And then the star of the show, you guys, the star of this experiment was we wanted to use calcium carbonate, or we wanted to see if the methanobacterium species ACI could use calcium carbonate as its sole carbon source um, while being grown in the presence of Martian regolith simulant. And if you don't know what that is, that is simulated Mars dirt. Um, and the answer was yes, it could it could grow in the presence of the regolith, which was super awesome. And it did use the calcium carbonate um, as a carbon source. And this is super important for us because all of this means that we can narrow the search for extraterrestrial Martian life, and it strengthens the potential for methanogenic archaea to survive um, on Mars. And we uh, further directions are we want to compare the growth of the methanobacterium on different types of Martian regolith. So in this experiment, we used MMS1, if anyone's familiar with it. Um, I've also tried JES1, but there's a bunch of different ones. And the only thing that is different about them is they have different chemical makeups, different amounts of things. Um, we also want to investigate the metabolism of iron and see if this organism is reducing iron. And we also want to continue characterizing this methanogen according to that checklist that I mentioned earlier. That is a speed run of, of three months of work, you guys, but hopefully it's cool. So if you guys have any questions, I can get into specifics if you'd like. Amazing. amazing. Yes. So feel free to put questions in the chat. Um, I guess while people are thinking of them, uh, can you talk more about, I, I don't do any Mars work, but how are you simulating Martian regolith? So it's, we just ordered it. There's a bunch of different companies that create Martian regolith. And just to be clear, because this has been a question in the past, it's just, it's not like any rocks or anything ground up from space. Like it's just what they suspect would be on Mars. Um, so we just ordered it from this company. Um, and MMS1 just has a lot of iron in it. There's a lot of different things in there. I don't even remember. There's a lot of trace elements. Yeah. Cool. Very interesting. Are you gonna try to do it follow up REU next summer? I really want to because I thought it was super cool work, especially because right when I left the RBU, we started using JES1, which was a different Martian regular simulant, and we had some really interesting results that were kind of different. I mean, it still grew, um, but the iron reduction that I mentioned, the me iron metabolism, we definitely saw some iron reduction, we think. So I would, I would definitely want to explore that more. Very cool. Yeah, thank you.
I think we're on, time. we are on her team now. So. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you guys so much. Thank you for Appreciate sharing all the work you do. That was amazing. Yes. Um, so next we have Anna. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So I, first of all, I want to apologize if my accent is just thick at points or if I don't have the right words. Anna, just one quick feedback. Can you put your microphone closer to your mouth? And that way we can hear you, but I louder. Can hang it somewhere. Could be better. I Perfect. Or if you maybe hold it closer too. Yeah, it, it's a bit better. Right yes. There. Perfect. Okay. So for now, I don't have any results. And this is most mostly a thing to make me try to speak about the subject a bit more. Um, so for now, I'm uh, trying to find interactions uh, on some substrates that are uh, metabolized by some uh, liver enzymes. And uh, I will try to introduce you a bit into the subject. Um, the liver has a cytochrome, I'm not sure that's how you pronounce it in English, uh, that has a ton of isoenzymes and these metabolize drugs. I studied pharmacy, so I wanted to see how some drugs can interact, especially on the CYP1A2 uh, isoenzyme. And so I picked a substrate and then I tried to see if there are any drugs that induce or inhibit uh, said enzyme. Uh, if you induce it, then more enzyme is produced, and so the drug that I picked as a substrate is metabolized more, and so it doesn't have an effect, the desired effect. And if the enzyme is not enough because it was inhibited, then the drug accumulates in the body, and so you have toxicity. So based on this in, um, interactions that I found in, in literature as uh, case studies, I try to simulate them on rats and then on microsomes. Could you uh, change the slide? Thank you. I did not use actual images because they're rats and it's a bit graphic sometimes. And then the microsomes are not especially uh, good looking either. <laughs> Why do I do this? Because we use many drugs and especially older people or people with chronic illnesses, they have what we call polypharmacy, which is many drugs for the same disease or illness. And so this can interact. And they can also interact with common things like, say, broccoli soup or grapefruit juice or even coffee. So in because we try to predict these interactions and we try to eliminate them, we we uh, picked these substances to have actual literature to base our uh, how, how do I put this our drug choices on. Uh, after we administer them to rats and we try to see how they work in microsomes, we use HPLC coupled with MS. It's high performance liquid chromatography coupled with the uh, uh, mass spectrometry. And then we try to see the, the concentrations of the substances in the plasma and if they are interacting. Basically, this is it, because we want to eliminate interactions and, and costs that come with them, because, you know, hospitalizations and people feeling bad in general, and we do not want that. That's very cool. I think you have like a, a great future with this project. Thank you. It's, uh, yeah, there are extremely many interactions. Do you have any visions about how you could link this to space? I, for now, I don't think so, but at, in different environments, drugs interact in different ways. So many, maybe if we change the environment, they will react differently. So maybe, I have no idea. If we try to make them interact in space, they will or will not. Or maybe if someone goes to space and has to take some drugs, maybe, I don't know, maybe they will interact differently in that person's body. 
Yeah, there's a like an institute out of somewhere in the U.S. that thinks about space medicine, but I haven't really thought about it. But I think that there's a lot of really interesting future directions with it. There could be. I hope so. Yeah. And Anna, you chose a very interesting one photograph, but a very interesting photograph for your presentation. Can you talk to yeah. us a bit about the equipment? That's the HBLC the thing it, it has many many modules and it has one where uh, the little vials are with the substance and then it turns and it has an injector right above it the the one with the vials is the one with the big window in the middle and then the one above has a, an injector thing that goes and picks substance from each vial from the carousel and then they up a bit higher are uh, they go through a column that's usually carbon based, based on polarity of the polarity of the substances we're trying to find. And up there in those bottles are um, solvents. I hope that's a word in English. <laughs> yeah, and those are also picked based based on the substances we're trying to find. And yes, yeah, kind of cool. Very exciting. All right. So we already have some requests. You want to see samples and results and images that you can share. So we do <laughs> request for those. <laughs> All right. Let's move on. Yes. So Nina, are you on? I don't think Nina is on. So we can Oh, go no. Sad. I wanted to hear about it. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, maybe she can go tomorrow. Um, yeah. Okay. So let's go forward to oops, Barrett. Barrett. Hey, everybody. Uh, thanks for giving us the opportunity to talk. Uh, most of my projects are not relevant to astrobiology or even biology, because it's really not my background. But the tech space is. And so this October, I'm going to be starting a master's program in space operations at Embry-Riddle. Um, aside from that, I'm finishing up the first in a book series that's a mix of technology and spirituality. Uh, that's really my flavor and my place in life. And so everything I'm doing kind of revolves around that, whether it's the space industry or tech. Um, I have a web show that I was working on, but that's kind of on hold because I'm in L.A. And um, there's strikes going on with the entertainment industry right now. Um, I'm working on um, an XR, which is basically um, a virtual reality slash augmented reality technology that's on that far right. I can't get into too many details on it, but it's kind of related to the book series. That book series I'm working on is going to be um, it's going to be a virtual reality based book series, so you'll be able to see it um, on that platform. Um, I do tech art. Uh, I just finished doing two fellowships for AWS with their cloud computing um, platform. So I want to partner that with the, um, the space industry because I want to leverage both of those to build myself as a brand. And like I said, even more so than outer space, inner space is really the greatest focus for me and, and enlightenment and how the two fit into place with each other. So I mean, unrelated, but pretty diverse are my projects right now, and very busy I am. You've got a lot going on. This is pretty cool. Yeah, this... I would love for you to think about how you can combine astrobiology with all the work you're doing as well. Okay. Yeah, Fair. which yeah. direction do you arts... think you could take it? Exactly. <laughs> especially with art or storytelling. I think that's really interesting and in inspiring. And if you ask most people, what do you think is astrobiology? Actually, people have very different answers. Uh, many people don't, don't know what it means. So there's a lot uh, that can be done for communicating it and communicating science better overall as well. Awesome. Yeah. Any questions okay. for Barrett? Yeah. I see uh, Natalia had a question for... Um, for Anna, which I think is answered already in terms of what are the different environments you experiment can work in? Yeah, I mean, basically anything, nothing is, I mean, you can go anywhere with it. There's yeah. there's no limit to it. Yeah. It, it, it depends on what you're trying to see. 
because as I said, if you go in space on someone, maybe the liver, the liver functions differently. Or maybe if you go on microphones, it's when you bury them, bury them in like some glacier, maybe they act differently. I don't know. Right. You just have to imagine it. Right. <laughs> that is true. That is the start of every good journey. All right. Um, well, anyone, we can open for any questions for any of yeah, our speakers. Exactly, Gabriella, Anna. Oh, um, and otherwise, uh, so we have a, a bunch more tomorrow. Um, and then I guess we can keep, if people are still interested, we can open the Canvas submission and, and keep doing these. Like we'd love to get to know about all of you. Um, so we yeah, can definitely keep add later dates. Perfect. Yes, keep the two three minute presentations ready, submit your, your deck, we can slide share and all get to know each other. And if you still haven't found a team member, well, now you now you know what everybody else does. So I think that was due actually Friday, right? Team submissions? Yesterday or Sunday, yes. yeah. So, um, But it's okay. We can still all be in the community together. Yes. Okay, so tomorrow, everyone, we have a keynote from a, one of the project scientists on the Mars Perseverance rover, which is it's going to be really good. Um, she does like all of the astrobiology for uh, Perseverance, and I believe the Curiosity rover as well. So I really encourage everyone to come. It's another one of our keynotes. Uh, she's really going to tell us all about how science on Mars is working. So I think we can end here. Yes. Anything else, Prachi? Oh, all great. Good to know, know each of you. Again, for everyone else, please share your world with us and uh, sign up for the Flash Talks. It's really great to know today, Gabrielle, Barrett, and Anana. So great job, everyone. All right. Thank yes. you, everyone. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Yeah.